Hi, uh, welcome to the New Voting Project. My name is Kunal, your host. And today we have a very special guest with us. We have Max Williamson, all the way from MIT, the East Coast, Boston, um, who is a uh, 2021 Truman Scholar. So congratulations are in order, I guess. Uh, great job. <laughs> um, and that is a, a scholarship given to those students who demonstrate excellent academic achievement, leadership skills, and a commitment to public service. Um, and governance. Uh, you, you are at, at MIT, but you also have a political edge, um, which is quite interesting. By the way, MIT, please accept my college application. Um, it should be on your desk. Uh, but in any case, uh, you have worked for uh, Senator Chris Coons as his campaign data director. Uh, you founded Engineers for Biden, the MIT chapter for uh, supporting Joe Biden for president. Uh, and you are a founding member and contributor uh, to MIT's uh, Director of Outreach at Civic Energy, um, which is a campus organization working towards, um, I guess, limiting uh, political polarization, um, which I think is, is frankly much needed uh, at the time we're at now. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I do appreciate it, busy college students, <laughs> but, but thank you. Sure, thanks. You know, I'm super happy to, to be on, and I, I just gotta say, I, I appreciate what you're doing here watching a lot of the other interviews you had and i think we need more people like you um just out there talking we just to people more who are on me. the front lines exactly yeah. we just need more of me no i feel you uh no <laughs> but let, let's let's dive into these questions um just for our viewers baseline talk a little bit about your background how you got into this where did mit come from um you know your college experience you're, you're about to graduate um so so i guess future plans Sure. Right. I mean, I think you you covered a lot of it there, but I, I'll give you the the play by play, so to speak. So I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware, um, which is the largest city in the relatively small state of Delaware, right on the East Coast, sandwiched in between Philadelphia and, and Washington, D.C. Um, Wilmington is the home of our president, Joe Biden. I like to, to plug that any anytime that I can. Um, but going through high school, I went to a, a STEM education charter school in, in Wilmington. And our freshman year, everybody had to take a just core computer science semester long class. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed it, dove right in, didn't know what I was doing, but I think gained a decent level of confidence by the end of the semester. And beyond that, started to take every elective in sight that was computer science related. So that was really my track throughout high school and was lucky enough to get into MIT during my senior year and decided that's where I was going to go. And if you, if you get into a school like a school like MIT or particularly MIT where 30, 40% of the undergraduate population is a computer science major, it's a no brainer. Um, so I, without really any second thoughts, decided, okay, I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a computer science major and basically assume that upon graduation, I would, and for a few internships before that, I would ship off to, to Silicon Valley, very near where you're sitting right now, Kunal, and work as a software engineer. Um, as many of my classmates and, and friends are doing or will soon do upon graduation. Um, and that, that was really my mindset when I, when I came into MIT. And I think well, one I'll say is, is MIT is a really fantastic institution for a variety of reasons. But one is that it's very good at instilling a problem solving mindset into each and every one of its students. So it's, it's not like Harvard or um, you know, other, other Ivy League schools or even just general liberal arts schools in that it is very focused on engineering. If you, if you come here, the vast majority of people want to be and will become engineers when they graduate. And that's what I thought I wanted originally. Um, but I think, I think throughout my freshman year, I realized that wasn't necessarily the, the path for me. So I'm in my freshman year taking a lot of these really hard computer science classes in addition to physics, chemistry, all that stuff they make you take anyway. Uh, really just kind of getting beat down by these classes. But by the by my freshman spring, I was kind of getting the hang of it. I'm like, you know, I can do this. I, I'm getting through these classes. I, I feel fulfilled to a certain degree. But I realized that like the work I was doing was not tangible in the way that I had really desired. Um, when I was in high school, I was a part of a lot of clubs and teams and organizations where you could see the impact of the work that you were doing right. every day. And I just wasn't getting that same feeling. So there was this really kind of what I think of now as being a life altering moment towards the end of my spring semester where I had two options. One was take a summer research position, which are pretty sought after at MIT and kind of like the first step on that path of being a Silicon Valley engineer. That was option one and stay at MIT, live in Boston over the summer. Or option two was take this almost unpaid internship 
back in Delaware in Senator Chris Coons' state office. And uh, I, I chose option two, um, much to the, the shock of, of a lot of people in my life, uh, mentors, advisors, my parents, some of my friends. But I, I showed up to this office that summer and I found myself helping people file their taxes that didn't know how to file their taxes, um, helping people stave off eviction where it seemed like people would be out on the street with their kids. And that's tangible, right? You, you see that impact every day. Um, and I was pretty much sold at that point on, you know, I don't know exactly, I don't know that I knew exactly what I wanted to do at that point. I still don't know exactly what I do, want to do, but I, I was like, I'm not going to go be a software engineer. And those people are great. They do great work. Um, but for me, I need to see the impact of what I'm doing. And I, I want to help people. I want to serve um, in, in some sense. So didn't really look back from there. And then uh, the pandemic hit, ended up landing in Delaware and doing all those other things you, you had just mentioned. Wow. No, that's that's a pretty solid story. I mean, <laughs> I got nothing to add to that. Um, no, I mean, I, I can identify with that. My, my, my family, so I, you know, I come from a background of scientists. My sister just graduated, um, you know, biochemistry um, and this, that, you know, my mother's a PhD in life science, father's PhD in life science. I live around science, right? Uh, but I chose the political route for exactly the reason you said, which is when, when you got into the space and you tried it out, right? You, you just, you had a little bite and you just kept going. It's like a candy bar. You know, you can never yeah. get enough of it. And, and you just, that's all, that's all you can think about. It's what engages you and motivates you. So, so no, don't worry. I, I, I understand. I accept you. Um, and, and, and I think you're doing phenomenal work. Uh, but, and we were talking about this before. So from Silicon Valley, obviously there's a lot of hype and, and energy around, you know, startup culture. And you obviously went in thinking you're going to work in software. Um, why did you decide to pursue that public service at the last moment? Why, why choose Senator Chris Kuhn um, state office? Like wh why make that decision? Yeah. I mean, I think it was a, just a sense of disenchantment that had slowly grown inside of me throughout that freshman spring. And it's not to, impugn the way their classes are taught at MIT or just impugn the culture there. They're both great. Um, but I was surrounded by people who do largely just want to go work in, work in finance, um, work in software, and yes, create products that in some time, at sometimes can, I think, make Thank positive you. contributions to yeah. society. But a lot of times they're not, and they are ethically, morally fraught. And it's not to say that everything you, you can do in, in government is, is free of those things. It's absolutely not. Um, so I don't like to make really strong judgments of, of what people choose to do with their lives. But for me personally, um, I felt I was going to get the most out of and, and really have the most pep in my step when I get out of bed in the morning if I was if I was working in some kind of government, nonprofit, public service role. Yeah. No, I think you made the right choice. And but listen to your parents. I mean, I think you made the right choice. Who knows? Uh, I could be screwing everything up. With uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, th I think I think you're you're well on your way. Um, and I guess since you've, you've been at this intersection of, of technology and non-public service, do you see yourself as only a, a technologist or the translator between, between tech and, and society? Do you think technology is the answer to, to the problems we're facing in the 21st century? Um, you know, because you, 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 bring, you bring about that problem-solving mindset. So, so I'm curious to know. Great, a great question, and one I find myself pondering a lot, and I think a lot of my, my classmates do as well. Um, technology is a is a double edged sword, right? Uh, there's there's a lot of good you can do with it, and there's a lot of a lot of bad that can be done with it, and has been done, and will will be done in the future. Um, as far as being a translator, I I think in my path so far, I've gone gone so far down the road of of policy and government that. Uh, that, that's definitely where I'm going to where I'm going to keep going. And I don't even know if it's going to be working on technical policy. But to your point, I think the the problem solving and just immersion in the in the tech atmosphere and, and knowing how to code, knowing how to produce software, and then knowing how the big companies kind of do that to a certain extent is extremely useful in in any kind of policy role. And I've I've seen that in a lot of the the jobs where they aren't hiring software engineers, whether it be on a campaign, whether it be you know, starting a local nonprofit initiative or um, working for local government or, you know, in the Senate, um, they, people view you differently if they think you have a unique set of skills, which I, I think I was lucky enough to bring to the table in, in many ways. 
and was able to make positive contributions to the, those organizations because I just brought a little bit of a different perspective there. Um, I think we absolutely need more of those types of translators in between the tech sector and, and what goes on at, at cutting edge universities like MIT or you know, any other school out there and the people making policy, the people setting the, the rules, um, the rules of the road for how, how companies and all other organizations in our, in our society operate. Because um, when there's a disconnect, and I think there is a pretty significant disconnect there today, you see bad things happen. And um, I think we can talk about plenty of those, but I just, I think like, you know, social media is one, one pretty poignant example these days of, of what initially seemed like a universally good positive technology starting to sour in, in public opinion because people have seen the negative impacts um, that it can have on people. Yeah, certainly. Um, and, and you had mentioned the disconnect between our policymakers and, and where technology is heading, its trajectory. Um, and I want to ask is, is, do you think as you enter the public policy space, you're about to graduate, um, do you think the arena is ready for, you know, handling artificial intelligence, the metaverse, apparently, you know, Facebook just renamed themselves, cryptocurrency is recently recognized by the infrastructure bill. I mean, things are changing, but are they, are they, are they evolving at the pace we need them to? So there's no doubt that technology is evolving extremely quickly. When you talk about the policy arena, that's it, there's a bunch of different arenas out there. There's kind of the the, the global um, sphere, and then there's there's the very local. Where I have the most experience is, is at the federal level, and um, specifically in the legislative branch. Um, and in short, no, there we're not we're not nearly caught up, and I don't think. Congress has ever been really up to speed on, on technological developments, but there are there are some pretty scary examples that I've seen firsthand or, or have heard of. Um, I, I just, there's there's a story I heard of when I was working in Senator Coons' office where he was in a meeting with a group of other senior senators and they were being briefed on uh, 5G adoption in the United States. And granted, this was probably three or four years ago when it was less of a, a front page news type deal, but um, one of the very well-respected senior Republican senators in the meeting about 45 minutes in said something to the effect of, well, what is, what is this 5G anyway, after they were talking about it for a while? And you think these are the people we're placing faith in to make our laws and um, make them reflect the changes that, that technology imposes upon us. That's kind of scary. Uh, you, you, you may have seen the clip of Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut just a few months ago, questioning a Facebook executive during a hearing and saying, well, what is, or will you commit to, to banning or ending Finsta? Uh, which any, anyone our, our age would know that's not an actual feature. That's just a way that users um, make use of a platform. Uh, right. So it, it, it's, it's funny on a surface level, but you really think if these are the people running the show, that's kind of terrifying. Um, so yes, I think we, we absolutely need more people in government who are, who are able to push for smart um, policy changes that reflect the technologies that, that are being introduced. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, uh, previous antitrust hearings, I mean, I've seen, I've seen senators and, and representatives ask hilarious questions um, and, and watched it live. So no, I, I understand. Um, and I, go ahead. Well, I'll just say, I, I didn't really answer your, your specific parts of your question there about AI in the metaverse and right, right, cryptocurrency. Right. So I, I'll just tackle those in, in turn here. Um, if, you, if you think about AI, it's, I just kind of straddle the, the really cutting edge research that goes on here at, at MIT and then right. um, what people think of it in the world and then more specifically in, in policy making circles. And I think we have a, people overestimate how good AI is and at some, at some times how, how robust or really smart it is. Um, I think it's really people, impressive for- No, I think it's because people hate autocorrect. So they just, they underestimate AI for real. And MIT, I mean, MIT, um, you know, sponsored a billion dollars for for AI research so it's something you know the institution you attend is really focusing on um so, so yeah. you're in that world well and, and some of the researchers here are at the front of the field um but it's interesting because they're they're not really a lot of the models that are used today are not robust in the um in the sense that they like to say which means they are they are approaching human level abilities as far as being able to visualize objects or identify objects or or comprehend stories and but I do think we will reach a point where things start to evolve very quickly. They already are evolving very quickly, but there was a good talk, a TED talk I was watching the other day by a, a leading AI um, researcher 
And he was saying, we're, we're probably at around the point of like a, a mouse's brain at this point. And he basically laid out this spectrum about you get to like the point of the, the village idiot, right? So like, I'm not a super smart person, but a, a functioning human being nonetheless. And then you have like Albert Einstein. Um, and at the rate that technology will, is projected to progress, you're basically gonna pass through both of those points in a very, very short amount of time. So it's not like AI is gonna catch up and have human level intelligence for a long period of time. It's gonna blow past us just be, by the way, by the nature of the way, ways that things advance. So in this talk, um, his, his chief directive to, to policymakers and then people, um, engineers making this technology was how do we infuse an AI with, with values, right? Values that we think are good and that will protect us and, and help society. Because once you really have a super intelligent machine there, um, there's not a whole lot that we're, we're likely to be able to do to control it. And that kind of gets into sci-fi Term territory. But yeah, it is Terminator. We're talking part. about Terminator right now. Like <laughs> I hope that's not the case, but I, I think it's something you're going to see people talk about more and more in the future. Um, as far as the, the metaverse, I think, uh, one, I'm not sure that rebranding will work super well, but it is it is saddening to see how how much we rely on social media these days. And I, you know, I find myself for, for hours every day, probably on, on Instagram, Facebook and, and all the others. Um, but I, I think, you know, we need to be, need to be, need to be mindful about how much time we're, we're spending on that. There's a, there's another interesting book I was reading by Robert Nozick, who's a, who's a renowned philosopher who had this idea of, a, of an experience machine, right? Where you would just plug into this machine and could basically experience anything you wanted. And there were really no stakes to anything. You didn't have to fight for anything and everything was just given on a platter to you. And as we think about going into the metaverse, I think that's a very similar concept. And if we really start to use meaning and value, um, if, if we are, if everything we want is always at our fingertips, uh, which is a scary thought, but that's, that gets away from policy and more into philosophy. So I'll stop there. As far as cryptocurrency, which I think was the last thing you asked about, um, I'm always skeptical of things that don't really, that are not rooted in any kind of real tangible value. In some ways, it's it's no different than, than gambling. You don't know if the value is going to go up or go down. I am by no means an expert on cryptocurrency, but I have a lot of friends who are very, very much into it and very knowledgeable about it. Where I do think it has value is it's more in the tra transactional sense and not really like a store of value. Um, places in the in the developing world where they can't trust their centralized banks and and their, their tax systems are not um, well well thought out a way for them to access like real capital, it can be through cryptocurrency and they can use that to buy and trade um, goods goods and services in a way that their their country's currencies don't necessarily allow. And I think that's where you're gonna see the most kind of uh, social value in cryptocurrency going forward. At least that's my hope. Yeah, no, definitely. A lot, a lot of thoughts there. I think AI is probably gonna surpass us. Not Terminator levers, levels, but you know, I'm just glad Arnold Schwarzenegger was the governor of my state, you know, I got him on my team, um, you know, dream team over here. As far as the metaverse goes, I still think it's a marketing stunt. Although, uh, let's see what happens. Um, and crypto, you're right. I don't like the fact that it's based on what the other guy will pay for it. Um, and it's too volatile. I'm by no means a crypto expert, but then again, same as you, a lot of my friends are. Um, and, and I'm interested to see how that will move forward. My biggest concern, you know, I actually had the opportunity to work for, um, Ro Khanna, who's a congressman here, oh, yeah. um, you know, represents Silicon Valley. So I, I understand that Congress lacks the comprehension that, for example, you know, one of my close representatives, uh, brings to the table, um, because he represents that district. Um, and, and I'm looking forward to that. Now you, you worked. Um, and learned a lot from your experience working for Senator Chris Coons. What would you say, you know, your, your, your colleagues, your, your uppers, um, your peers had, had learned from you uh, during that time? Okay. Very interestingly worded question. Uh, I mean, it was definitely more of a absorptive experience than, than me telling, telling that you know, I'm, I'm at most of these jobs, like bottom rung, because I'm, you know, a 22 year old at the time, 20 and, and 21 year old just trying to, to help in any way that I could. Um, I, I think there is value to bringing the engineering mindset to the table, as, as I've said before, you don't get a whole lot of software engineers going to work on the Hill. Right. Um, so there, I think there was uniqueness in that. And uh, you, you talked about crypto being addressed in the infrastructure bill. Um, I was, they basically, in, in Senator Coons's office, there's, there's three different 
basically larger office spaces for the, the various teams. And I was working on the foreign policy team, uh, but it was the day they were voting on amendments for the infrastructure bill. And they were, there were a bunch of crypto amendments that were attached to how you're going to tax it, whether it's going to be right. regulated or not. Exactly. Um, so at some point they realized there was an MIT student sitting, you know, the next room over. So then they kind of called me and they were, you must know what this is about. Like, how do we vote on this stuff? So I was um, then frantically trying to figure out what, what the heck the, the amendments were actually proposing and, and trying to offer my expertise there. So I think that was a, a unique place that I got to add value. Um, but really, I, I learned so much more than they could ever learn from me. They're, these are just incredible public servants that show up every day. Um, trying to make the laws of this country a little bit more just and a little bit more effective. And um, being a part of that, I think, was was great. It was also a very cool summer to be in in D.C. because you had uh, you had the, the U.S. Competitiveness and Innovation Act, often referred to as the China Bill Pass, and then the, what is literally a once-in-a-generation um, infrastructure investment. This is the Bipartisan Invest in America Act. Um, I got to see that pass in the Senate while I was there, which was, was very cool. And the foreign policy side, I got to see a lot of developments and sit in on a lot of, of cool meetings. There are, unfortunately, the summer ended with the fall of, of Kabul and Afghanistan and all the fallout after that, which was a kind of sad way to, to end my experience there. But I really did really get to see a lot of um, a lot of ways that the, the government operates from the inside there. That's pretty cool. And I will just add um, one of my current senators, Senator Alex Padilla, former graduate of MIT. Yeah. Uh, from I had a Zoom call with him over the summer for my cohort through MIT. Yeah, yeah. So it's very cool. cool. You're definitely not um, and not alone. Um, I mean, granted, he, I think he might be the only graduate from MIT. I, um, I tried to flash. I rang him in the, in the hallway when I saw him one time, but he was too busy focusing on, on other stuff. We, MIT makes a big deal out of his yeah, class. Yeah, rooms. yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, uh, my, my robotics mentor always flexes his. I, I always ask him, where did you go to school? He said, I went to MIT. Uh, no, but, I, but, it, but it's pretty cool. And, and, and I'm glad you had such a great time. That sounds like fun. Um, now, I, I kind of want to talk 2020 election. Again, this is um, the new voting project. We're obviously trying to spread awareness on voting, voting rights um, issues in the United States. So, so give me, you kind of run through. You're, you're a college student at MIT who's, who has a, you know, a, a strong interest in, in, in political, um, in political um, legislation and, and influence. Um, and, and you're noticing this top, you know, national election, top to bottom, every issue counts. It's hyper-polarized sites. You've obviously done some work um, with, I believe, civic synergy. So, you know, kind of run me through your, your thought process on the 2020 election. It's a bold question. I know. It's loaded. It's loaded. Uh, I'd say uh, terrifying for most of it. Uh, I was constantly unsure of how things were going to turn out. And just to give you some context, I started off the year working in, in New Hampshire, Massachusetts on now President Biden's campaign. And this was when no one thought that he would have a prayer in hell at winning the nomination, let alone the White House. Um, I remember sitting in the, the ballroom in Nashua uh, the night of the New Hampshire primaries where the campaign was pretty much on its death knell. I mean, we lost to Amy Klobuchar in that primary and didn't even crack 10%. I, I remember leaving, driving back to Boston that night. My mom was texting me saying like, well, I see like the Klobuchar campaign's hiring. You know, you could think about going to do that. <laughs> um, and I was just like, no, 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 stop. So but we got back and we had our pretty much entirely volunteer team aside from the paid, the one paid staffer who was our amazing state director in Massachusetts and, and got to work for the next 28 or so days. Um, really not knowing, you know, we were thinking that any day this could end. Um, and we're going up against like the Bloomberg campaign, which hired 54 full-time paid staffers to just mob the state. And it was difficult to compete against, but at the end of the day, we're realizing we're, we're fighting for values here. Um, we're, we're fighting for a guy who, is, who has been serving his country in elected office for almost 50 years and who really has, I think, what, what, is, what was and continues to be an impressive vision for the future of this country. And being able to be a part of that was awesome. Um, Fast forward those 28 days later, uh, you know, we win, well, we won the South Carolina primary on February 29th, I remember, and then we're like, okay, well, maybe we have a chance. Super Tuesday was three days later, and we, <laughs> I, I won't forget, we're also sitting in the ballroom, not really a ballroom, just a rented room in a restaurant for the Biden campaign on the night of Super Tuesday, and there's really not many people there because expectations were not high for us. And slowly, as the returns start coming in, you see just people start flooding in, um, volunteers that, we, that had helped us out, or, or people who were just interested in witnessing history to a certain extent. 
Um, so that was an amazing night. And then from there, COVID hit about 10 days later. And right, exactly. most of my student organizi organizing turned online, but I was lucky enough to then get plugged in with Senator Coons's campaign back in Delaware, which is a totally different operation where we were pretty sure we were going to, we, we did have a progressive primary challenger, which we could not ignore what happened to you know, the Joe Crowley's of the world um, with Representative Ocasio-Cortez. So we had to, had to take it seriously, um, but it was, I was given a lot more authority in that campaign just because it was a smaller operation. And I got to, to talk with people from my home state, which I think was, was great. Um, but towards the end, we were spending, me and my coworkers, we get done work on Friday. And if we didn't have events over the weekend, we'd get in the car, drive into Pennsylvania and start knocking on doors or passing out literature for the Biden campaign. Uh, Cause that was what was keeping us all up at night. Um, but turned out well, they, the, the crazy thing was they had the election night event in Wilmington, Delaware. So I, <laughs> I was in my car parked about 50 feet away from the stage where the president, well, president elect Biden came out and declared victory on election night. And that's an experience I will never forget ever. Um, so it, it ended up going pretty well, but it was, it took a lot of work from a lot of people. Um, I'm just, I'm just glad we are where we are today and, and not experiencing another tr term of, of president Trump. Yeah. I think that's well said. No, I mean, having been on campaigns is definitely exhilarating um, and, and really keeps the blood pumping. There's never, um, there's never not work to do. There's always something to do on a campaign. Or phone calls. Yeah, yeah there's always, always something to do um, and, and, and things to finish and volunteers to find and doors to knock. Um, I was actually poll working that primary uh, in, for the state of California. So it, it was definitely a momentous night um everywhere um now i, I just want to ask you know you're 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 obviously affiliated with with um with stem you know you you like computer science um you wanted to pursue software engineering um do you think more people of that background should should consider um getting involved in public service yeah unequivocally absolutely yes and i've i think i've Done a, well. I've I've tried very hard to convince more people of that. Civic interview. The the organization that you referred to earlier was was born out of MIT. I was not involved in the founding of it, but I've I've started working for it this semester. And they had a their their main principle is that we are too polarized as a country, and that we need to be able to come together and and talk. But just by virtue of of it being founded at MIT, which is a school primarily of engineers we were able to push a lot of people to, to be more involved in, in civics. And we're not saying every engineer should go work for you know, a, a nonprofit or an NGO or, or some government organization, but at least have an awareness of what's going on around you more so than just the surface level Twitter, you know, drive-by tweets that we see all the time. Cause that's not real policy. That's uh, it's surface level politics that I, I don't think serves to, to benefit anyone. So, yeah, we, we need more engineers in, in public service roles. Um, I think there was, there's been a lot of progress on this recently. So when I was when I was working on the Hill, I was blown away by the number of, of fellowships that are available to people who are actually in their careers, not people like me who are still in college, but there's something called the, the AAAS fellowship where they fund dozens of, of PhD students or postdocs every year um, to come work on the Hill and they can make really substantive progress on their very narrow area of expertise, um, which is huge. I think we had like two or three of them in our office. And there's a host of other fellowships like that where you bring in really smart, capable people who are first and foremost scientists or engineers, and then you, you lend their expertise in a, a somewhat nonpartisan way um, to a member of Congress or to a committee or to an executive branch. And um, I think all of those organizations are better off because of it. I was lucky enough that MIT has, has noticed that public service is important, um, that, that civic awareness is important, and they have a lot of programs where they fund students like me who don't want to pursue the traditional high paying path of, of software engineering or other industry work. And um, I've gotten the last two of my summers funded by the, the first the political science department at MIT and then the, the PKG Center for Public Service, which is a fantastic organization within, within MIT that basically shells out money to students who are, who are interested in um, pursuing my social impact um, internships and fellowships and that kind of stuff. So I've been lucky in that they, they funded me. I've gotten to have a lot of, gotten to have a lot of great opportunities because of that. Yeah, no, and I'm, I'm glad to hear MIT has a, a civic awareness um, and, and um, 
certainly the the right and the resources to help students um, succeed in their paths. I think that's something I look forward to um, if I do get into MIT, um, but it should be interesting to see. Um, now you you actually worked in 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 data in in helping trace and contain the pandemic in your home state of Delaware, I guess. And this was in, with an organization called Newcastle. Um, talk about that experience. I mean, there's a public health crisis going on once in a century pandemic. Uh, I imagine that was quite a, um, you know, um, monumental task, right? Right. It was a bit of a crazy transition in my life because you have, you know, working on a, on a Senate campaign um, with a pretty small staff. So everybody's really involved in, in federal level, international level issues um, go, going from what I was talking about, the, the victory night celebration where you have the, you know, the next president of the United States and, and many other luminaries along with him that night on a stage in front of you. And, and the next morning at like 10 a.m., I was on a, the, my first day of, of this new job where we basically had from, from my county government. So you're going from, you know, this big soaring rhetoric, all these massive country nationwide institutions to local Newcastle County in Delaware. Uh, it's a pretty big contrast. Um, but I love the job at the county more than anything else that, I, that I've ever done, I think. Uh, we basically, you may be familiar with the CARES Act that was passed in March of 2020 unanimously by, by the Senate, put about $2.3 trillion in the economy. And there were a lot of provisions on that funding with uh, not just how it could be spent, but when it had to be spent. So my county, which originally I think got like $328 million from the CARES Act, had allocated most of it, but there were a few chunks left that they didn't know how to spend. And they it basically, you, you spend it or you lose it. Um, so they were trying to come up with projects that would that would not be a waste of money, that would actually have a, a positive impact um, that they could get off the ground between then and the end of the year, which right, you know, we're, right. you know, we're, we're talking November 8th at this point. And everything had to be services rendered, goods purchased, delivered by the end of the year. Um, so my county executive, Matt Meyer, who is an amazing guy, um, decided they wanted to put $6 million towards basically building from the ground up in eight weeks, a COVID testing and genomics lab at Delaware State University using county, using federal dollars funneled through county government. Right. And they needed someone to run that whole project. Uh, so they, they, for some reason, chose me to do that. Uh, I didn't know <laughs> I anything think, about- I think I know the testing. reason. <laughs> well, I didn't know anything about COVID testing, didn't know anything about the regulatory processes involved in procurement, um, you know, testing, compliance, uh, all HIPAA stuff. Um, but so I dove in, did a lot of reading, basically mapped out exactly what we needed to do each day from then until the end of the year, and just put my nose to the, the grindstone. And um, the day before two, the day before Christmas Eve, we were we were running tests in the lab. We had to do construction. We had to buy equipment, hire staff. Uh, it was by no means like me doing all this stuff. I was kind of tying all the pieces together. Mm -hmm. uh, but we had like an excellent team of consultants. There's um, Dr. Derek Scott at Delaware State University, who is just a fantastic scientist and all around dude, um, who was leading the, the medical charge there on the on the university front. Uh, it was awesome to work with him. And we got to work with this other group called Testing for America, which gave us additional funding for testing for other schools. Um, learned a ton. But my, my pitch is for like people who are who maybe your age or even my age or um, in between is that if you have an opportunity to go work at a local level at any point you know, in college or, or shortly after, do it because they will give you so much authority and responsibility um, that you would not get working at the, at the federal level or, or even sometimes at the state level. So right. I, it was a hugely rewarding experience. And going back to what I said at the beginning, you could see the impact. I mean, there was, there was one EMT I was talking to who in the early days of the lab being up and running, we started running their tests instead of um, shipping them out of state, which they cost 10 times as much. Um, and and one, of our, one of the people working for the lab called him to say he, his test was positive and he was about to walk into a nursing home full of elderly immunocompromised people, right? So like that's, yeah, he pretty, could pretty plausibly claim that that saved some lives there. So to be a part of a project that was able to have that kind of impact was, was huge for me and solidified my, my, my path to really work in, in government and nonprofit type roles in the future. Right. No, I mean, I, I can completely concur. The other day I'm on a call, uh, you know, housing is a big issue um, in the state of California, New York. I mean, it's, it's an issue across the United States, um, but it's one here that we have to deal with, especially. 
Um, and, and I'm literally, I'm face to face with like two city council members and we, we are discussing what they're going to vote on the next day. I mean, they have to vote on, you know, X amount of units. I thought it was like 650 unit housing development that's going to be built right next to me. What are we going to do about it? We're bringing about like 50 residents together, just face to face with these city council members, telling them and explaining to them, you know, our positions and, and how we feel. Um, and at the localist levels, you could really touch, you could really touch the change. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. Um, I myself have worked on a campaign at every level federal all the way to local so uh, yeah. the ripe old age of what 18 S 17, <laughs> 17, 18. 17 uh but i mean so i understand what what it's yeah. like to be at every level and just and, and and the differences and and the similarities between each uh so, so yeah. no, i i understand um and, and i just want to um ask right you know we're on this question of of having more scientists and, and researchers and, you know, kind of building like a brain trust uh, that, that, you know, congressional people can use. Um, do you have any aspirations to, to run for, for political office as of right now? I, I understand it might be a little too early. Not a terrifying concept. Um, yeah. I, I have no idea. I have no okay. idea. That's, okay. yeah, I, I wouldn't say no to anything, but okay. so that's yeah, I want to do it. I want to, I want to help people. Right. And if that's, if that's working or leading a nonprofit or an NGO, like great. If it's being like an appointed officer in some state, local or, or federal agency, great. If it's, if it's finding a, an, an office that I think I could do a lot of good in and that I feel like I was the best person, then, then maybe, but that's so far in the future that, you know, who the hell knows. All right. So we're going to talk about that offline. Don't worry. <laughs> Uh, but no, no, that's, I'll, I'll accept that answer. Uh, um, does, here's my, here's, I will say this. So okay. All right. I always kind of, we're turning the wheels. We're getting somewhere. No, I mean, people that say yeah, out of the gate, like I, I want to be, I, I want to be this job, right? It doesn't not regardless of whether it's an elected office or if it's a, a specific role within an organization, I, like that doesn't, I feel like speak well to people. It is, can, it can often be insincere, right? Like, tell me about the issues you want to work on. Um, tell me what, you, what problem you want to solve. And then you can talk about what title you want under your name when you're tackling that. Um, so that, that's, I, I very firmly believe in that. It's like, you should be issues, problems, uh, areas first, and then, and then worry about exactly how that pans out second. Right. And what issues, what issues do you think you're going to start to tackle? Yeah, so I've been... <laughs> Unique in that I've, I've bounced around. Sorry, my earphones. I've been unique in that I've bounced around a lot. So I, I was really for a while because of the pandemic constrained to just Delaware. And I kind of like that. I, I love my home state and, um, you know, hope to hope to live there someday again. But um, I was working on education issues. I was working on healthcare with this lab and, and other things and working on a campaign that it was that was bounded by the borders of the state. Um, but now having gotten opportunities from from MIT and and the Truman Foundation, which basically connects you with a network of, of really impressive change agents, as they like to call themselves, all over the country and sometimes all over the world. I'm thinking like, you know, Delaware is a pretty small place. There's a million people whom I think are great. You know, that's the community that raised me. That's where that's home. I will always be home. Um, but part of me thinks I, there's a lot of other people facing a lot of other challenges out in the world, not just in the United States, but abroad. And then working on Senator Grins's foreign policy this past summer, I really got some exposure to that and you know, wasn't able to travel or anything like that, but we'd hold meetings with aid workers who were expelled from Ethiopia by the TPLF in the, the, the north of the country, um, resistance fighters in Afghanistan before and after Kabul fell to the Taliban, uh, exiled journalists from Kenya who were, who were basically were documenting atrocities performed by police officers there and, and kicked out of the country for it. Um, that's real. That's real stuff. And it, it seems like it's so far away. But when you talk to the people, you realize it's, it's not. Um, so I think I, I would like to work in some kind of foreign policy role, at least um, in the near future. So I actually starting it. I, I think I am starting. Well, I am starting a new job on Monday, working for this group called the Himalayan Cataract Project. Um, so cataracts are a huge issue in the developing world. They're not in the United States and most of the Western world. It's when you're, the, the natural lens in your eye goes opaque and you can't see anymore. Right. Um, there's super simple, cheap surgeries to pop out the lens, stick in a synthetic one, and boom, you're good to go in like a day. 
if you go to places like Ethiopia, Ghana, um, Bhutan, they don't have any kind of, they have very limited surgical infrastructure to be able to deal with that. And the costs are a lot higher. So this organization sends these, these missions overseas to just perform hundreds, if not thousands of surgeries in just a few days here. And you watch these videos and, and people who haven't seen for 10 or 20 years, they wake up the morning after they've had a surgery and they take these bandages off and they're able to see their, their, you know, their kids, their, their spouse and um, everyone else. And they're, they're like, that's, that's a crazy level of impact. Um, so I'm gonna start working for this group doing some software data science stuff for them. Um, but I'm super excited because that's, again, so palpable and tangible and, and the, the impact that it has on people who may be a world away, but like you think about people being able to see after they haven't been able to for so long, like that's, that's huge. And that gets me fired up. Um, so there's, there's a very specific narrow issue that I, I wanna work on for at least a, a bit. Um, but I think, you know, national security, international development, foreign relations more generally, um, those, are, those are things that really interest me at this point. Good. And voting rights. Yeah. <laughs> Just a plug. You can't do all the others if you don't have a solid, fundamental, safe, secure electoral process at home. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's absolutely true. Same straightforward, right? You know, wonder why we're debating it after so long. Uh, but and, and I just want to close out. Right. You've done impeccable work. You know, you've 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 found your niche um, in, in an almost unimaginable way. I mean, kudos for you, right? What would you recommend my generation? And you're Gen Z. Yeah, you are Gen Z. We're, we're the same, yeah. Exactly, we're, like, we're the same, right? Four years apart, yeah. Uh, what would you recommend for our generation, those that feel exhausted, alienated, um, ignorant, um, who or who want to be engaged in policies, whether it be education, um, voting rights, et cetera. Climate change is, 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 is a big one these days. Um, what, what is your advice uh, for, for that next class of voters? That's an excellent question. And one that I don't have an adequate answer to, but I will certainly try. I think alienation is the, the key word there. The, the rhetoric that we've been taught by older generations who are now in power has really gotten to our core, right? So we're, we're toxic in the way that we discuss as a generation between ourselves. And we're extremely polarized, left, right, um, and everywhere in between. It's, it's very hard to have conversations. And I, I saw that firsthand when I was organizing students to vote for, for Joe Biden, who people call the neoliberal shill on, on my campus, um, or you know, cozy with China and Russia and Hunter Biden and all that kind of stuff from people on the right. Uh, and that's that's not that's not helpful. You know, if we want to we want to have a chance as a generation of of trying to solve climate change, um, income inequality, and just a host of other issues, like we need to be able to talk to each other and not just with people whom with whom we agree. Uh, so what I've done and what I what I what I would like to get more students involved in is is having these conversations. So civic synergy, what we talked about, we have. Um, we're going to be running this program throughout the spring. So here's a shameless plug to all your viewers that you should go um, look up Google Civic Synergy. We should be the first result and go apply for the program. We're going to have working groups for college students and graduate students to come together with people they don't agree with and, and talk about policy issues and try to hash out some kind of a proposal. And ideally, we're going to then present those proposals to members of Congress or executive branch officials um, over Zoom, probably and just have a good conversation. And I think slowly trying to depolarize the way that we talk to each other. Um, and it's not just gonna happen with one organization like Civic Synergy, it's not gonna happen in a year. It may not happen in a decade, but we have to try. Um, we gotta do everything we can to, to not sink to the lowest common denominator. Um, and I, I think that's really the only way, the only way forward here. And it, it means a lot to me. And that's why I'm, I'm pushing so hard on, on civic synergy and a lot of these other, these other groups that, that facilitate these kinds of discussions. Right. I think that's exactly the purpose of this um, conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm with you. Um, and, and, and that, that'll be something I look forward to and will encourage. Um, but all in all, thank you so much for, for, for your insight, uh, for your perspective. Um, I think it's quite, quite a, quite a journey you've been through and one that I think um, you'll, you'll, you'll find direction in going forward. Um, you know, if you ever decide to run for office, door is always open. Feel free to come back on the show. Uh, if not, door remains open. 
and and tell us tell us what's going on. If you want, uh, you know, shout out your your social medias or for Civic Synergy. Um, you know, I can put it all in the description as well. Definitely, we'll do. I know on Instagram, Civic Synergy, Civic Synergy is just that. It's at Civic Synergy, one word. Um, so go check us out and apply. Yeah, <laughs> apply. Uh, please do. And no, I I do wish you the best of luck. Um, and and you're about to graduate, so so I look forward to seeing great things. Hopefully, still gonna pass a few more classes, but <laughs> I I think you I think you'll make it. I guess. Uh, but no, thank you so much, Max. I do appreciate your time. Thank you, Canal. I, I hope you get in the MIT. Um, if, if any MIT administrative people or you know admission staff are watching, this guy's great. You should let him in. Yeah. Um, okay. But best of luck with all your your applications. You're great. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, I think what you're doing is really important and and incredible. Um, so I hope you keep doing it. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Take care.